last week, I started a, a sermon series, and, it, and today we're going to end it. It's a, only a two-weeker, uh, a two-parter, I should say, and uh, on, on fake news. And this morning, I want to talk about the lies that Satan speaks into our lives. Amen? And he, how many know that he speaks in theology of false news? Uh, it's a type of journalism that consists of misinformation um, spreading through the traditional news media and, and going through social media. And uh, Satan is pouring out fake news over your life, whether he's whispering something to you or he's speaking uh, through somebody else, telling a lie about you that's not true. And, and uh, so the impact of a lie is powerful and is dependent on what I do or what you do with that lie. Let me just that you give fuel to the lie if you focus on the lie. Amen. And a lie that is not believed and not acted upon is lifeless. It has no power on its own. We are the ones that give life to that lie if we agree with it by entertaining it over and over in our minds. There are some that may be dealing with lies that have been said about you over and over again. It's running through your mind and you can't even go to sleep at night because you're focusing on the lies of the enemy. And that's what, uh, that's what he wants you to do. He wants you to take all your thought that you have about God and, and put it on the lies, the fake news that he has said about you. So in order for, for, uh, to, over, to overcome that or to defeat that, we need to uh, smash it with the truth. The Bible says that Jesus is the, 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 the life and the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? And we need to understand that we need to put Jesus where he needs to be in the midst of everything we are going through. Jesus, uh, Jesus' power is also, let me just say this, is limited. Hear, hear me say, just be, be very careful what I'm saying. Jesus' power is also limited to how I receive and apply it. Let me, let me put it this way. I'm not saying that Jesus doesn't have the power. He has the power. He's the, he's the all-powerful. But we are the ones that allow God to do what he wants to do. We're either going to feed into that lie or we're going to allow Jesus to penetrate through that lie. Amen? Listen to me careful. The origin of all lies is Satan. Amen? The power of a lie is what we do with it. Agreeing with a lie or giving room to breathe gives it life and power. The intent of a lie is to control and destroy. Amen? You think about the lies across media. It is a weapon to destroy what's being targeted. So if I speak a lie about somebody, my goal is to destroy you. Am I right? When the enemy, Satan, delivers fake news about you, a lie, he's trying to destroy you. He's trying to pull you away from the one that gives life, the truth. The power of truth is, char is characteristic of the reality that is found in Jesus Christ. The impact of truth on my life is connected to my acceptance of my faith in the Lord. The intent of truth is freedom and life. And when I'm too busy focusing and trying to prove my worth, I do not have then to the power to live and enjoy the worth that I found in Jesus Christ. Because I'm trying to defend my worth. I'm trying to defend that lie. And we're putting all the energy in that lie. In other words, we're giving fuel to that lie. Somebody repeat this after me. Satan is a liar. Somebody say it like you mean it. Satan's a, Satan a liar. In John chapter 8, verse 44, it says about Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan is a liar. Somebody say that. I'm going to ask you again over and over just to remind you that he's a liar. And this morning, I want to share with you three common lies that Satan will lie to you. And then I'm going to share how to overcome those lies. And if you're a believer this morning, if you're a follower of Jesus, you know that you have an enemy. Amen? Don't think that you don't have an enemy. Because we are followers of Jesus Christ, 
it automatically puts us in an enemy with, with, uh, with Satan. I read about an interview of a 100-year-old man who was celebrating his 100th birthday. And the reporter was, was so excited about meeting this 100-year-old man and his full of life. And the reporters asked this 100-year-old man, what are you proud of? What are you proud of? The old man replies, says, I don't have one enemy. He pauses for a moment, and the reporter was excited, excited, fantastic, awesome that you don't have an enemy. The old man added, I have outlived every enemy. I want you to understand if you reach the age of 100, you're still going to have an enemy, and that's Satan, all right? Because your enemy is not going to die. Later, he will be thrown into a bottomless pit for a thousand years. Later, he will be cast into the fiery uh, 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 lake. I'm talking about your spiritual enemy today. He is real. His name is Lucifer. His name is Satan. He is the devil. He is a real spirit. He is not equal to God in any sense. He does have power and influence, but he's not all powerful. Amen. The Bible calls him in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, that he's the devil, Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, the accuser. In John 12, 31, he is called the prince of this world. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he is called the God of this age. Peter calls him your adversary, the devil, who roams around like a roaring lion. Amen. That's who your enemy is. And I'm going to tell you this morning what he wants to do with your life today. He is in the business of deceiving. He's in the business of destroying humanity. He is in the business of promoting sinful ways. He is in the business of, of, of living with a sinful attitude and sinful lifestyle. He's in the business of holding you bondage. He doesn't want you free. He wants you entangled. He does not want you want you or your family or your grandchildren, for that matter, to follow God. He wants you to doubt God. He wants you to doubt his word. If Satan could have his way, every single one of us this morning would have, would have lived in bondage to the evil passions of the flesh. There is not a marriage in this room that will stand. He would destroy every positive relationship that you have. He wants to mess up your kids. He wants to mess up your spouse. He wants to mess up your home. He wants, to, he wants you to, to, to live in your weakness, whatever that may be. If you're a believer, you're a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, you are engaged in a warfare with him. I want you to understand that this morning. If you're a new believer, I want you to understand that you're in a spiritual warfare with the enemy. And this morning, I want to show you how you can live victoriously in defeating the enemy of your life. We want to dismantle the enemy by understanding his strategy, his tactics, his ways. Paul told the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, out of the Amplified Bible, that we must know the word and our enemy. The Amplified Bible says it this way, to keep Satan from taking advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. We should not be ignorant of his schemes. But can I be honest and transparent with you today? There's some of you that are ignorant to his schemes. You keep falling to his trap. You keep falling to his lies. You believe his lies. Some of you believe more of his lies than the word of God. This culture is believing the lies of the enemy. I hope we don't have a blind eye to that. This culture, you know what today is? Today is coming out day for the homosexuals. How much more does the church need to be coming out more? The man of God, the woman of God needs to be coming out saying who you are in Christ instead of being silent. That's the lies of the enemy that is infiltrating into our culture. The lies of the enemy saying that my father was a drunk, I have to be a drunk, and my children have to be a drunk. That's the lie of the enemy. The lie of the enemy says, well, my father was an abusive uh, husband, then I must be an abusive husband, and then it, it, it trickles down. You know, it's time for the man of God and woman of God need to be broken from that generational curse. Just because it has happened doesn't mean you have to fall into that lie. But because we don't know the truth, we don't know the word of God, then we fall into the lies of the enemy. 
You see, Satan cannot take advantage of you unless we are ignorant of his schemes. Satan is a liar. If you don't know who Satan is, if you think he is plain, if you think if you're listening to his lies, if you think this is a game, he will take advantage of you. Everything we need to know about our spiritual life is found in the word of God. And we need to have that knowledge because we are in a war. Our country spends millions of dollars trying to find the tactics of our enemy so we could defeat them. How much more does the church have to know the tactics of the enemy so he can be defeated. Let me give you an inside look of the word. He loses. We are winners. We are victorious. If we're living victoriously, then he's already defeated. But why are we continually living in the lies of the enemy? Why is the church today living in lies of the enemy? Think about that. The lies of the enemy causes us for our prayers to be hindered. Think about that for a moment. Well, pastor, I pray every single day, but yet we're falling into some of the lies that is causing a blockade to our prayers to the heavens. Repeat with me. Satan is a liar. I remember growing up and hearing this phrase and I had to look it up so I could Say it correctly. Some, some speak Chinese, some speak Vietnamese. Satan speak lying with ease. That's his native language. Just like we speak English, he speak lies. He doesn't speak truth. The Bible we just read, the verse we read earlier, there's no truth in him. If there's no truth in him, he's going to speak fake news. Believing a lie will ultimately affect your behavior. Satan is a liar. He wants to affect your prayer life. And how you live and how you react to things will determine on the lies you believe. I heard some parents lie to their children. For example, I heard a parent buy toothbrushes for their child, for the children, as to say. And, they, and, and the parents tell the children, I have downloaded an app on my phone that will tell me when you brush your teeth and how effective you brush your teeth. Now the children will believe and they would brush their teeth better. Now I heard another parent tell their children, if you hear the ice cream truck music on, that means there's no ice cream. For two years. Children were not be was believing there's no ice cream in the ice cream truck when the music was playing. <laughs> what you believe is going to affect on how you behave. That's why I said about the alcoholic, the drunkard, the abusive, the addictive, the homosexual. All that is lies from the enemy. All that is lies that many are believing and caught up in. So let me talk about three lies that I want to share with you today. Lie number one. Satan can attack you at any time he wants and however he wants. That's a lie. Have you ever been in a church service? And maybe for us older people, we probably, come on, I won't believe I said I call myself older. For those that are of age, you've been to a testimony service, and you get one lady come out and say, Pastor, I have a testimony. The devil has been attacking me all week. Every single day he's been beating up on me. But I give God the praise. In fact, every time she gives a testimony, she says the same thing. Or he says the same thing. This person, I'll let me give you some truth to refute that. If you are under attack, it is because God believes in you. 
God believes that you can overcome Satan and you can. You hear me? Let me explain, to, let me explain this a little deeper. You, un, you must understand that there are limits that the devil can and cannot do. Let me give you a visual here. Many of us have dogs. We put a collar and a leash on a dog. And there's certain limitations where that dog can go. Am I right? Same thing with Satan. God has a leash on him. He can only go as far as God lets him go. Do you hear what I'm saying? But why do we allow that lie that the devil's beating up on me and all this stuff? You see, our Heavenly Father gives us all that we need to win. Here's the question. How do you raise your kids? Well, Pastor, that's, that's personal. That's between me. I, I want you to think about that question. How am I raising my kids? How are you raising your kids? Do, do you protect them? Do you shield them from, from difficulty in their lives? Do you keep them from, from ever fighting for what they believe in? I hope not. Because if you did, they will grow up sheltered. And, and when, they, when they get into that real war, world, look out. Because they're going to have an unexpected reality. Growing up as a kid, I was told by my parents, don't let nobody take your stuff without permission. And if they do, you ask for it. And if they don't want to get it, give it back. You get it back. Now, my parents didn't raise me as a bully, so don't think, well, I was a bully as a kid. No, I was never a bully. But I was taught to make sure I get my things back if I didn't give it away. Why didn't your father, why didn't your parents stand up for you? You know why? Because they knew at a point I'm going to grow up and my parents are not going to be around to get my stuff. I say this to say this. God allows conflict in your life with the enemy. Why? So that we can know who we are, so we can know whose we are, so we could learn that God is behind us and Satan cannot just have his way with us. Amen? You know, God didn't call his children just to, 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 to get beat up by the bully. I remember the first day that Nevea went to school and she said, the first thing I wanted to tell Nevea is you get up and you slap that little boy. Don't let him poke you and push you down to the ground. The pastor, what happened to turning the sheet? I believe in that. If you keep pushing me down, I'm going to swing back. <laughs> See, too many times the enemy comes and he pushes you down, and then you don't do nothing, and he pushes you down, and he picks on you, and he lies to you, and we stay there, and we cowardly cry and say, oh, poor me, the devil's attacking me. You're not fighting back. You're not fighting back. That's a whole different sort sermon. Now, if you look at the book of Job, you will learn that Satan had to get permission to mess with Job. And if you never read the first two chapters of the book of Job, I want to encourage you, read that. Read that when you get home. Read that tomorrow as your devotion. Read it, digest, because it's awesome two chapters of Job. The whole book is good, but the first two chapters are awesome. But check this out. Satan has a conversation with God. And in verse 7, God tells Satan, where are you coming from? The devil says, well, I'm coming from earth here and there. I'm just everywhere. And, and God says, you know what? I have this man. He's, 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 he's a level-headed, righteous guy. His name is Job. Have you heard or have you seen my servant Job, there's none like him. And the enemy responds back. Why, sure he does. Look at how you have blessed him. You have protected him with a hedge of protection around him. But if you remove that hedge, he will probably curse and turn away from you. You see, God was a believer in Job. And God says, okay, go test Job. And God told Satan, you go this far and no more. And Job verse 12, 1, 12 says, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, and do not lay a hand on his person. I love that. 
And if you have read the book of Job, you remember what happened. Job lost everything. But at the end of the book, the end of Job, you see that he was given double for his trouble. Amen. And the same thing happened in chapter 2. Satan appears to God again and accuses Job. And he says, if I touch his body, he will curse you in your face. Look what verse 6 says. It says, the Lord said to Satan, behold, he's in your hand, but spare his life. So it wasn't enough for Job to lose everything. But the devil heated up a little bit more to Job. And God says, you can mess with him, but don't take his life. Now, without going too much in detail in the book of Job, you know what he went through. But I want you to see that is that Satan's power is limited by God. Satan is on a leash. He'll only go as far as, you, as, as God lets him. Even in the New Testament, Satan is on a leash. In effect, he has to get permission. Look what it says in Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord said to Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. He's got to get permission. The truth is, God lets us go through stuff. And you may be going through some stuff right now. And as part of the human race, you're going to face some trials. You're going to face some giants in your life. You're going to go face some obstacles. But in the end, your faith in the Lord will prevail, will prevail and your faith will come tested. And I believe the church today in 2020, these last six, seven months, the church has been tested. I believe the Lord says, you know what, I want to, I want to let the enemy do what he needs to do. I, want to, I believe that the church is going to stand. I believe the church standing because of what the faithful of the church. But again, on the flip side, I believe some churches are struggling because of the lack of faith. And I believe the Lord says, you know what? I believe in my church. I believe in my church. Looking locally here, I believe God is saying, look at victory. They have prevailed. That church has been a praying church. That church has passed the test. The word says, when the enemy comes like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against it. That's Isaiah 59. What happens if the enemy forms a weapon against you? We are reminded that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Amen. What if stuff happens that I don't like? It's going to happen. Hear me. It's going to happen. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is found in Jesus Christ. So whatever you're facing today, whatever circumstance you're going through, God believes in you enough that he thinks you can win. So you can win. He has given you his power. He has given you his authority. He wants you walking away knowing you, who you are and whose you are in God. We look in the mirror. I wonder if we see what God is seeing in us. I wonder when we look in the mirror, do we see what God sees? What are we saying? There's no way I could do this. But God says, he sees you capable. He sees you strong. He sees you able. He sees you like his children, able to handle the conflict and, and come out a winner. Lie number two. Lie number two. Satan has blinded so they will never see. Let me say it again. Satan has blinded them so they will never see. We talk about our loved ones. We think we we talk about those who don't know Jesus Christ. We know about the eternity that those who do not know Jesus Christ will go into eternal damnation, hell. But if you've been around church long enough, any length of time, you probably heard this scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Now, if you take that scripture by itself, it seems hopeless, doesn't it? It seems, man, my, uh, my loved ones have been blinded. There's no way for them to see God's light. It sounds like there's nothing God can do. It seems like there's nothing we can do. The enemy will take that verse and pound it deep into your spirit. And you actually believe the lie. If you love people, it's hard to see their minds blinded from the truth. But what do we do for those who are bound in sin? 
What do we do with those who have been blinded by Satan? We know what the word says about eternity. We have real concerns. But Paul gives us great encouragement on verse 5 and verse 6. I want you to check this out because it's powerful. In verse 5 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. In other words, you have to preach Jesus. I'm not talking about cramming the word of God into down somebody's throat. No, preach Jesus. And what Paul is saying is that we need to keep talking about Jesus every time. Paul says we preach Jesus Christ as Lord. Every opportunity we should lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Even in front of those who do not know Jesus. Amen. We are not to take our light and hide it under a bushel. We need to allow the word of God, the light to shine. Now the Bible says if Jesus lifted up, what would happen? Thank you. He will draw all men unto him. The more you speak Jesus, the more he's glorified, and the more those around you will see the light. Every day in your conversation, give him glory. Preach Jesus. In that verse also, verse 5, it says, And ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. In other words, serve them. Serve them. And to care for them. Paul says, ourselves as your servants. In other words, serve your loved ones. Invite them to dinner. Invite them to dinner. Don't invite them and have them bring dinner. <laughs> hey, come over for dinner, but go ahead and bring something on the way in. Huh? No, you serve them. You, you provide the, the Coke and the Pepsi. You provide the pizza. You provide the dessert. And I know we're fasting and all, but whatever, whatever you're fasting, you just... <laughs> Spend time with them. Serve them. Let them see the joy you have in Christ as you serve them. Remember how you came to Christ. Paul tells us that we are to remind ourselves of our conversations to Jesus. Is there anyone here this morning that you were blinded until you saw the light? Any, anybody? You share that story. You remind yourself. You know... If you did that for me, you could did that for my loved ones. At one point, you couldn't see the light of the word of God. And God broke through. Look what verse 6 says in 2 Corinthians 4. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Let me remind you, Saul, who was now Paul, who wrote 90% of the New Testament, was blinded by the lies of the enemy, that he became a persecutor to the Christian's church, to the Christian church, to Christianity, until he encountered Jesus as the light in Acts 9. He made his light shine in our hearts. What he did for you, he could do for others. And just because they may be hard as a rock and you, every time you talk, it doesn't seem like it's penetrating, you'd be surprised what, what God through his spirit is doing in their life. You may not physically see what's, what the, what's happening, but every time you speak the love of Jesus, every time you declare the name of the Lord, there is a softening in their hearts. He has made his light shine in our hearts. What he did for you, he can do for our others. Let me give you two thoughts here pertaining to that. If God can heal blinded hearts, can he not heal the blinded, well, the blinded eye? Can he heal the blinded heart? Absolutely. Secondly, since when, since when did darkness resist the light? Darkness cannot resist the light. You go in a dark room and put a light, even if it's your phone light, it dispels darkness. But we have to thoroughly convince, be convinced that God can save someone. God can break the hardness of a sinner. So what's your job? Your job is to pray. Your job is to thank God. Your job is to believe and not doubt that the Holy Spirit is able to convict man, man of sin. So don't give up. The Bible says in Acts 16, verse 31, they reply, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. What a scripture to rely on. Remember, Satan is a liar. Lie number three. 
You aren't holy enough to have prayers answered. That's what the enemy will tell you. Who do you think you are to pray to God? Don't you know your past? Don't you see what you're doing now? You aren't holy enough to have your prayers answered. Satan is very predict predictable on what he says to people. Before you give your life to the Lord, he tells you you're a good, you're good as is, is going to get. You may have made a few mistakes. You haven't sinned against God. You haven't killed anyone. You ain't that bad. What do you need Jesus for you? But the minute you turn your heart to Jesus, the devil changes his tactics. He becomes your accuser. He reminds you of your past. Why should God listen to you? When you pray, he will come into your mind and tell you there's no way God is going to listen to you. You must be crazy if you think he's going to really going to, he's really going to answer you. Satan is a liar. He will tell you you're out of your mind. You're too big of a sinner. You're righteous enough. You aren't, you aren't holy enough. You haven't lived a pure life. Revelation 12.10 reminds us that he's the accuser of, of our brothers. If you have repented and if you turn away from your sinful life, we, are, we know that we become the son and daughter of God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We don't have to come to God as a second-class citizen. We need just to come to God with confidence. Confidence in what? In confidence in knowing that Jesus died for us and rose three days later and is coming back for his church. It's not our holiness, but it's his righteousness that has imputed us. So the next time Satan reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. Amen. Worship team, if you don't mind coming up. You know, the enemy will rather have you in a corner feeling bad about the things you did or the things you didn't do. Forget the past. Focus on the promise of God's word. It's according to your faith. Jesus is saying yes to you today. Yes, that he loves you. Yes, that his promises are for you. Yes, he cares about you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Don't allow your behavior to be affected by the lies of Satan. Don't let your behavior be dictated by the fake news. Remember, Satan is a liar. I want to share three, four truths before we go into a time of prayer and a time of communion. God's truth, you are not a failure. You are strong in Christ. It's, I delight in weaknesses, in insult, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Truth number two, God isn't done with you. We are in a process, and it's a good process. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. That he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Truth number three, God has plans for you. Jeremiah 29, 11 and 12. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Verse 12 I love. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. In Deuteronomy 28, verse 13. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord, what is that? The Word of God. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you always be at the top and never at the bottom. At the top and never at the bottom. 
Some of you need to get out of lying. Some of you have been lying, been accepting the lies of the enemy and have caused you to be put in the bondage. Some of you here this morning may say, you know what, Pastor? I have failed. That's past tense. Don't live there. Move on. Some of you this morning may say, Pastor, I am failing. That's the present tense. You still can change. Some of you may say, Pastor, I am a failure. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. That's a lie. We can do the first two, but you can never be the last one. Not who God called you to be. God did not call you to be a failure. The enemy may call you a failure. The enemy may whisper things that you're good for nothing. Why try? You always mess it up. You look at yourself in the mirror, you don't like what you see. The Bible reminds us that we are a masterpiece. Who are we to say, I don't like the way you look, when God says, I created you? God has already decided it. He's already decided your destiny. He's already decided who you are in Him. You have to accept it. Don't accept the lies of the enemy. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. Before we partake in communion, if I could have those that's going to be serving, get ready and get ready lined up here in the front. I want to pray for you tonight, today. I believe in my spirit there's some here this morning that you have fallen to the lies of the enemy. You are more focused on the past than focused on the promises that's in his word. 